fungi are not ne normally those pretty colors. Those were all dyed with those cool fluorescent protein or fluorescent dyes. But, um, and that's a particular kind of fungus called an ascomycete. And because it spores, when, with fungus, it's all about how they reproduce. Kind of like plants, they're identified on how they reproduce. Fungi are all identified on how they reproduce. And the ones that reproduce in um, sacs like that, often with eight spores, then, are, are called ascomycetes. Because, you know, they can't name it simply and call it a sac. So it would be a sacomycete. No, it's got to be an ascomycete. <laughs> and those are ascospores. And um, anyway, it's, it's one of the types of fungi that are kind of easy to identify when you see those sacs, when you squish those little tiny black dots that are on the plant, and you squish them, and you see, oh, sacs with spores in them. Okay, it's an ascomycete. At least you've got it to class already, even though, remember, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species? <laughs> you know, well, at least you know what class you're in, and with the fungi, that's pretty good sometimes. <laughs> Okay, what do fungi do? They cause all kinds of problems. They can affect, infect any part of the plant. And that is fungus's role in nature is recycling, which means recycling any organic material they can find, like your plant. <laughs> that, that otherwise we'd be buried in sticks. You know, if we, if we didn't have any recyc anything recycling things, we'd just be buried in sticks, you know? We'd have dead wood everywhere. But, um, so, fungi has to break things down. That's, that's their life. That's what they live to do. They live to eat things. But sometimes they eat the wrong things, in our opinion. And um, fungi typically grow if you get a, a, a piece in the, in the ground somewhere, in a group of plants somewhere. They typically grow out in circles just like on a petri plate, they grow out in circles. So if you see circular patterns in turf, or in that case, baby tears, think root rot. Think there's a fungus in there, you know, a stem rot. Or um, think when you see mushrooms growing in a fairy ring in a big circle, there's another example of a fungus that was in the center there, and it just it grows out and grows out. It just keeps growing out in a big circle until it hits a sidewalk or something that messes you up. But root rots are really common with water. You know, when, when, oh, when you're overwatering, you get root rot. Because you've killed roots, they may have, you know, died under anaerobic conditions or something like that, and that's when they make, be, become really good food for a fungus. Not that some fungi don't go ahead and kill the plant themselves in the first place so that they have something to eat. They, you know, Phytophthora, you hear about that one? That's actually now a fungus-like organism, not an actual fungus anymore, but it's a major cause of root rot. And it's, they have ways that, that, that name, phyto, meaning plant, and that P-H-T-H is from the Greek for killer or destroyer. Mm -hmm. So Phytophthora is the plant destroyer. So that's, they do have ways of killing the plant all by themselves without without something else in causing the damage first. <coughs> so then you might see conchs on trees. All, uh, most of the, the conchs on trees happen to be a heart rot organism. It's a fungus that eats the, it's not killing the tree, but it's eating the center out of the tree, not necessarily in the sapwood where you know, the growth is happening. But a lot of times they can cause enough structural damage so that it snaps off in a storm. So, as a matter of fact, right after that most recent storm we had, I had to go look at a tree in one of the county parks that was supposedly the second oldest tree, California pepper tree in California, that had snapped and had conks in it. And I was like, oh, guys, this, is, <laughs> this, this one's not so good. You might want to think about, they don't want to remove the tree because it's a historic tree in a historic county park. But I said, you've got to get rid of that big limb over the building at the very least because, you know, there are conks coming out of the tree. It's got heart rot. There's mycelium in the tree. So we look for, you know, anytime you've got a conk under a tree, don't park uh, coming out of a tree. Don't park under it in a store. Okay? <laughs> All right. 
fungi cause foliar diseases. And um, some of the diseases they cause could be leaf spots, blights, where you just kind of wipe out that whole part of the leaf, and powdery mildews, and rust. So, and this is another imported thing that we did not, remember when we didn't have rust on gladiolus? <laughs> that was another disease that, um, an invasive disease that got here. And um, now they've backed off of it. I think the USDA has backed off on the quarantine against it because it's, it got everywhere really fast on all the gladiolus. But when it first got here, we were ripping gladiolus out of people's yards for a while there to try to keep it under control. But it escaped. So, um, Leaf spots. This is, this is one of my favorite little leaf spots, actually. <laughs> it only goes to members of the rose family. And that is, there it is on flowering pear. Um, there it is on raphiolepsis. It needs water. This is this one, the rusts now, was we looked at in the last one, rusts are dry, powdery spores, and they blow in the wind. So they move by wind. Um, these spores are produced in a gooey, in that center of that black spot there, is a gooey little matrix full of spores. And they're produced in goo. And so they move around by splashing water, because they don't really blow in the wind very well, because the goo holds them together. And this is what the spores look like. That's why it's one of my favorite, because it's called goo. <laughs> because I think it looks kind of like three-tailed mice. You, know? <laughs> you have the, you know, the lobes on the, on the spore, the cells of the spore, and then you've got three tails on it. So, but somebody, who, you know, somebody before me thought it looked like an insect, so they named it Entomosporium. So the bug spore. So. I think it looks like mice, but yeah. I didn't get to name it. <laughs> black spot of roses, another fungal disease, causes those black spots. And I apologize that this, you know, picture isn't the greatest. That was my old microscope. I have an even better digital one now. But um, this is a two-cell, little tiny spores again produced in a kind of a little matrix in those black areas of the leaf. You scrape them off, you put them under the microscope, you see those spores, you know, oh, black spot of roses. Okay, now we know what to do about it. Now I can refer you to the UC pest note that, talk, that talks about it. <coughs> this is one in the last couple of years on incoming plant material. The Central America has seemed to have had a heyday on anthracnose diseases. This um, anthracnose diseases are where the plant gets blighted like this. This is anthracnose on sycamore. And um, inside the tissue are lots of little black dots. Or the technical term is an LBD, right? <laughs> Very scientific. But so you've got lots of little black dots. If you magnify it up, you've got CD and um, little, little black hairs sticking out of those black dots. And then inside, gazillions of one-celled little spores that are again produced in a gooey matrix, so they're moving around by water. And um, we had like, what was it, 10 or 12 new species of Colletoctricum that's never been reported before in the United States in the last couple of years. Wow. Mostly coming in on plant material from other countries. Some of it was like on uh, fruit. Our, we have two dog teams also that run the, um, the sort at the FedEx, the post office, and at UPS. And sometimes people in other countries like to send fruit to their relatives here. And by the time it gets here, it's usually like this rotting, gooey mess. It's like, ooh, do you like your relatives? <laughs> <laughs> but um, we got a lot of Colletoctricum off mangoes and, um, this, in the last couple of years. And um, we had one on orchids, on Cindidium orchids. This is Colletoctricum cindidicola. And those were in nurseries, and they had to clean it up, and we had to keep going back and making sure it was clean. That one you can get rid of if your sanitation is really, really good. Sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. I can't say it enough for controlling a plant disease. It's get those infected leaves out of there. You know, some places don't have the cleanest you know, 
nurseries at all. They, the, the, the dead leaves are still in the plants. The dead leaves are on the bench. The dead leaves are on the, on the floor under the bench where anytime you water, the, the spores just splash around again. You gotta get them all out of there. You gotta get it all out of there. You gotta treat the new growth with fungicide to protect it. And then you can get rid of it. But it takes a fair amount of work. It takes diligence. And we have to keep going back till they learn diligence. <laughs> because <laughs> because they can't, we can't release them. When it's a brand new is it fungus like that, we, you have to make sure it's clean. Because you don't know what it's going to do. If it jumps off and goes to another kind of plant and wipes out, they had one, a dogwood at Thracnos. It was in the, on the East Coast. They had um, a new Calitoctricum on there. They didn't know too much about it, but they kind of let it go and it jumped off of whatever it was imported in on and went to dogwood in the forests on the east coast in Maryland and Virginia up to New York and wiped out the understory of dogwood. Oh. It was so, the USDA takes a new Calitoctricum, a new anthracnose fungus very seriously. So anthracnose is the name of the disease. It's caused by several different fungi. Calitoctricum is one of them. So we've just been finding a lot of them lately. I don't know why, but or else, well, in part, um, the DNA lab up at the state lab is really, really good these days. <laughs> They're really on it, and um, so before we couldn't tell before DNA, we couldn't tell the difference between them. <coughs> if you're looking at them morphologically, and a single cell clear score looks they all look alike pretty much. And um, now they they run a DNA test on them, and they're like, oh, you've got something completely new. You know, this isn't supposed to be in the Western Hemisphere, or this isn't supposed to be you know, <laughs> in North America at all. So we've been getting lots of new reports on things this way. Also, I want to talk about very briefly this Q on the end of it here. The state of California has a pest rating system, and they're called A, B, C, D, and Q pretty much. A means like it's one long bean, or the Asian citrusillid, or the Mediterranean fruit fly. Those are serious pests of agriculture, and they are to be exterminated however you possibly can. You know, um, Q means treat it like an A. We don't know for sure it's new, it's new to science, we, we don't know enough about it yet, but for now, treat it like an A, eradicate it where possible. So B is something like the glossy wing sharpshooter. It's already in some parts of California, but not in other parts of California. So that is regulated at the discretion of each county. The Ag Commissioner each county can say, we don't regulate it here other than for shipment to another county because it's already here and you can't eradicate it. So C kind of means common, it's everywhere. You know, it's got to be clean in a nursery. A nursery is only allowed to sell a few on a few. You know, if you have the same pest on a few plants, you can only have a, few, a little bit of it on, on a few plants. And if you have an extensive, you know, outbreak of aphids on your nursery stock, you've got to clean them up before you can sell them. If the inspector finds it, of course. <laughs> but, and D, A, B, C, D. D means, okay, it's a minor pest. We're not going to worry about it, pretty much. So that is the pest rating system. So sometimes we're, when I put this little letter behind there, that's, that really tells us what to do about it. It doesn't really mean that much for you guys necessarily, but it tells us how to treat it in the nursery, in the lab. If I you know, see something, I go, uh-oh, it's an A-rated pest. I can tell the inspector, we got an A-rated one. They know what to do. They know if it's an A-rated nematode, they're going to have to go back and survey and look for it in other plants and they're going to have to destroy those plants with it. So, but if it's C, it's like, okay, tell them to clean it up, you know, and, <laughs> and D, all right, we're, it's a D rated pest, we're going to skip that one. So, yes? If it's an A rated pest will that's brought into you, will there actually be a team that goes out to that area and just sort of combs the area, or I mean, what, when you say they go out and search for it, whatever, what, what physically yes. happens? Yes, if it's in a nursery, absolutely. We go back and hit that poor nursery hard. And what if it's in the neighborhood? <laughs> um, if it was like a fruit fly that's detected on a fruit fly trap, yes. We, they go out with a lot more traps. 
and like something like Mexican fruit fly, then they will do a, a release of sterile males to try to eradicate it. Or with oriental fruit fly, they use pheromone confusion. They tie little twist ties around the neighborhood, and that confuses them. That you know, they're like the boys are all going, "Oh, there's a female everywhere, and I can't find her." And I'm so confused, and they don't get to mate because they can't find each other. <laughs> so it depends again on the pest, exactly what it is and how it's dealt with. Okay. So sometimes it's sterile male release, sometimes it's pheromones, yeah. But there are ways to do it sometimes, and sometimes not. You know, like the fusarium wilt on palm trees. There, there's no treatment for it. All they do is they're trying to keep it out of the date palm growing regions of California and Riverside and Imperial County because that's a commercial crop. You know, we we love our dates, and if that fungus got in there, it would wipe them out. So that the area is just a quarantine to keep it out, rather than, you know, evade, you know, rather than keep it in. So it all depends on the pest and the pest and how you control it. So Asian citrus psyllid, it's an A-rated pest, but we can't really eradicate it anymore, or and it's even kind of hard to control. So we just kind of have to let that one go and say it can't be a nursery stock. So it depends on the biology of the organism every time. So. Okay, downy mildews. Cool stuff here. This is, this is another one. We have been finding, we've been getting lots of new downy mildew diseases. You may not notice it or not. You may be wondering why your impatients didn't do so well in the last couple of years. New import, downy mildew disease of impatients. How come your basil wiped out last year? Mm -hmm. And you didn't, you didn't get much on your beautiful basil that used to be so gorgeous. Um, downy mildew, a new, another import that's not <laughs> supposed to be here. And of course, you know, we, where did we find them in California first? San Diego County. <laughs> <laughs> Things love to live here. Now, down, down, the downy mildews, in this case, these are all Paranospora species. Downy mildews are not a true fungus. They are in the category with um, algae. They've re reorganized them. But for us old people who still remember when we got our first mycology class, um, downy mildews were then a fungus. So yes? When you talk about these things being carried in, obviously not from here, but carried in by other plants, <coughs> are they carried in by us? You know, if I'm in an area of, you know, um, Arizona, I was out hiking, camping, or whatever. Can things be carried on us? Can we be the vendors? Right. Certainly they are moving around with people, but I would say if you were hiking the Grand Canyon, you aren't bringing back, you know, downy mildew and right. with you. You know, it's it's coming, it's moving on plant material somehow. But I mean, in general, I mean, you talk about so many different things. I mean, any of these other ones? Yeah, I and mean, people are moving them, absolutely. Oh, okay. People okay. are moving them. They, you know, Insects don't fly that far on their own. <laughs> you know, and spores don't blow in the wind that far. You know, rusts do sometimes. But um, no, for the most part, people are moving. And things like this, a downy mildew is an obligate parasite. It only lives and reproduces on living plant material. So people have to be moving living plant material of it. <laughs> you know, you, you went to the East Coast and you saw those pretty little flowers and you wanted that variety for you and you snipped a piece and brought it back and you didn't realize it had downy mildew at the time. Or it, I don't really know how they're getting anywhere, but certainly they are moving by people. <coughs> and when they trace them, when they trace like the way the Asian citrusillin pattern of it in California, how it spread, it's along the major freeways. Wow. Same thing with fruit flies a lot of the time. It's <coughs> along the freeways. It's not moving you know, in a random pattern or anything, it's moving along the freeways. So, yeah, that's, so certainly people are moving them. We don't know how exactly but, and who, but people are. Anyway, the downy mildews I always think of as my Christmas organism because it tends to show up in the cool part of the year. It seems like we get a new one every year around Christmas time. And um, they grow on sporangia, the spore-bearing structure of it. 
and it often looks like reindeer horns. Mm -hmm. See those little parts down there? It looks like a reindeer horn, and the spores are circular, so you've got the balls that are hanging off the reindeer horns, so <laughs> that's why I think of it as my Christmas fungus. Um, this year, the new one at Christmas time, in the, the December 11th, Friday afternoon, about 3 o'clock, that's when you always find the really good stuff that you're going to have to say a couple hours extra to make sure that you get the word out on this. I was looking at ice plant, and I've been getting lots of red apple ice plant in. And um, see this kind of fuzz on that brand new growth there? And you, could it be dust? Could it be the plant? No, it's the fungus. Well, the, the, the downy mildew. And that's what this was. It's that's the downy mildew on red apple ice plant. And um, I, I took some samples from my neighborhood yesterday and brought them into the lab and put them under the microscope. And sure enough, they're there too. Because <laughs> I noticed all of a sudden the red apple ice plant had been cut back all over the place. And I went, hmm, I wonder why. I wonder if they thought that was frost damage. It wasn't. It was it was the brand new downy mildew. So. Paranospora mesembryanthemi. How about that for a nice one? <laughs> well, that's because um, the red apple ice plant, the genus name of it used to be me mesembryanthemum or something like that. And um, so oftentimes an obligate parasite is named after its host. So that gives you a clue there too. But anyway, so that's the, that's the new one on red apple ice plant. Another one of the water molds. Phytoptera, which is also in that same group now with algae. It's not a true fungus anymore. But phy oh, and cut off the bottom here. I actually did leave you in the name on there, but <laughs> this is Phytoptera remorum. And we have not had that here in this county since 2008, but it's the cause of sudden oak death up in Northern California along the coastal range where it's killed probably hundreds of thousands of trees by now. Um, just, you know, from Monterey County North, but it is not established here in the Southern California because this is a disease of cool, wet conditions. And what are we getting? 90 degrees in February? <laughs> Temperatures over 90 degrees kill this particular phytophthora. Yes? Do you talk about nurses having an obligation to destroy the plants when they find them before they sell them? And I noticed, like, if it's got an A-rated pest on it, yeah. Oh, so, it's, so they can have like light on the tomatoes that are still selling them, or the downy mildew on the basil, that's not really... Well, they shouldn't be. It's illegal to sell, to knowingly sell a disease plant in the state of California. So they shouldn't be selling that. You know, it should be cleaned up, but something slips sometimes, yeah. And, well, for, and if you're talking about a big box store, a lot of times that material wasn't even produced in California. It was, it was grown in Georgia or something and then shipped here. I just noticed some of the tomatoes are growing in the nurseries, but kind of sold in the winter, already have the, <coughs> the dark light spots, and then it should flash through the down and build it all over the basil, and they're still selling it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you want to report that nursery to us, we will, <laughs> we will send an inspector out to put it into it. <laughs> That is what our department does. You know, if you're getting overcharged, you know, at, 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 a, at a scanner in, in any store, and you know, that's what we do. We'll you we make a report and we send the inspector out and they check the scanner and sure enough, if it's if it's not scanning properly, <coughs> we make them fix it or shut it down. Same with gas pumps. You know, if, if you think that you pump 10 gallons, but it says 11 gallons, and you're getting charged for 11 gallons, it's never under. Or you know, <laughs> or, you know anyway, if you, if, if you think the gas pump isn't working right, you report it, we go out, we check it. That, that is what, this, what our department does. That's what the med weights and measures part of it is. So if the scale at the grocery store isn't working, you think you bought a pound of fish, but you know, it, you didn't. You think you didn't? Um, we send them out. We check the scales. That's that is what you know can be done. <laughs> so anyway, Phytophthora remorum, sudden oak death. Um, this is what these are, these were when it was first found in San Diego County. Our first find back in two thousand three or four, I think. But we haven't had it since two thousand eight. But it was on camellia. 
It was only on camellia in greenhouses with shade under shade cloth and overhead irrigation. Those were the conditions that allow it to exist in, in Southern California. So once you get rid of all that, you don't have it anymore. But um, in this case, Phytophthora morum sort of has a plant factor in a way. It loves bay laurel, humble area, and um, it makes zillions of little spots. That's what all these little spots are, and I'm sorry they're not coming out very well. That's what all, there are zillions of little spots on there, and there are zillions of spores in those spots. And it acts, so whenever you've got a bay laurel there, it doesn't really hurt the bay laurel very much, but it does, the spots go off and go onto the oaks and the tan oaks and kill them. It's, it's sort of like a plant vector there, because they'll blow off and blow in the wind or move with rain onto other plants. So, but, and there's the, there's the, what the damage it causes on oak. This is the diseased part where a spore landed and caused the disease. This is the healthy part. Oak bark, when you scrape it and it gets exposed to air, it is kind of reddish. But that black line on there is real typical of a Phytophthora edge. So um, if you scrape something back and have a black edge on it, or if you see, um, if you scrape an avocado and you see black vascular tissue, I want to know about it right away. Because <laughs> those are pretty serious diseases sometimes. So, but anyway, that's what happened. That's Marin County there, dead trees all over the place. And um, trees with that black tissue. And this is all just dead tissue and eventually it just girdles the tree. It kills the whole water carrying system of the plant. So, and this is what Phytophthora, the sporangium, looks like. This is what's growing on a bay laurel leaf right there. That's the, all that fuzz is the fungus coming off. And then each one of these is the little sporangium. And in the sporangium, and that's why it's not, are gazillions of little zoospores that swim, that pop out and swim. And um, they're mobile, they're tailed, they have tails on them so that they can swim. And each one of those can start a new infection. Wow. So, <laughs> they're very tiny. <laughs> so they get into oak bark. You know, oak bark is normally really thick and resistant to lots of things, but not this particular disease. And this is the extent of the quarantine in California. Just that edge. So, and then there's a little bit in Curry County, Oregon, right there on the edge also. And those are the, those are the only places where in the whole United States where sudden oak death is, you know, in this system, in the ecosystem. So they've had a few nurseries up in Washington and Oregon, well, and Northern California that had it, but they've been eradicated for the most part. What is the um, cure for that? Um, destroy the infected plant material um, and a lot of fungicides, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, now, our oaks in San Diego County are dying. This is uh, oak mortality. Red is more mortality. Um, but it's not sudden oak death. You know, you, you may get some calls on that. It's gotten a little better, but um, a few years back, man, all of our calls were, I've got sudden oak death! And it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> what you do have is this evil little beetle down here, mm -hmm. the gold spotted oak borer. And that is the beetle that is killing our oak trees. And it's now spread to, it's not just, it was limited originally to San Diego County, but people, and they believe in this case, it's moving on firewood. Um, it's now in Riverside, LA, and I think Orange County's also. Yeah. So in, in every case, they believe it's been moved on firewood. So buy it where you burn it. That's our anthem for these days. <laughs> so, okay, enough about the darn bugs. <laughs> You'll hear more about them in your entomology session, wherever that is. Powdery mildews. There's lots of, yeah, <laughs> lots of powdery mildews out there. Um, when I worked at the Yankee Ranch, powdery mildew on poinsettia didn't exist. This is another important thing. I don't know how it got here, but. Um, now it's now there, there's powdery mildew for just about everything, and I always know it's summer in in the lab when I start getting the first crepe myrtle samples with powdery mildew on them. 
And um, the spores can come off, d depending on the type of mildew, singly or in chains. And when you look at, if you see, ever see them under the microscope or hands with the downy mildew, so you can tell the difference, they look like a little shrub. They're coming up like a little shrub. All those little reindeer horns are making it, it looks like a little shrub, but the, the powdery mildews always come out like a, in a straight line, like a stick. So just if you're, you know, looking at fuzzy stuff under your hand lens and going, huh, oh, what's it doing there? Shrubberies, be afraid of a downy mildew. Sticks, be afraid of a powdery mildew. So, okay, powder, everything gets a powdery mildew. There it is on sycamore. There it is on oaks. Oaks get a couple different kinds. The one on oak um, actually causes distortion of the new tissue. So it likes only the new tissue. These are... Powdery mildews take less water than other fungi. So they will thrive in just about no water but high humidity. So um, they don't need water to move around. The spores blow in the wind. And of course, you've all seen powdery mildew on your roses, and powdery mildew on there's powdery mildew for lots of different things. But just like there are lots of rusts out there, too. This is another group of. Rust is a disease, but it's also a group of many different fungi that cause that disease. So um, one of the most common ones is named Puccinia. And believe it or not, geranium rust, you know, I think that came in in the 70s. It wasn't here at first. Um, so there's daylily rust, uh, Puccinia hemerocalidus, a rust on sunflower, uh, rust on mint, and rust on eugenia. This one's Puccinia sidii, and it's, it's also fairly new. It only got here about the same time I started in the department. It was one of the first ones. It's native to Central America, and it, it moved in on the Myrtaceae, members of the Myrtaceae. It started in, they noticed it really first like in Brazil. In Brazil, they were going huge plantations of eucalyptus for paper, for paper pulp, and this little rust from a little weed there in Central America, jumped off and jumped onto the eucalyptus. And it's been going crazy ever since. It's now in um, Hawaii, wiping out their native ohia. Um, if you've ever seen that red flowered ohia in, in Hawaii, it's wiping them out. Um, the Australians are really, really afraid they're going to get it. And of course, Australia is the home of eucalyptus, so their big eucalyptus groves there really working hard not to get this particular rust into Australia. So it's interesting. Um, chrysanthemum white rust is a federal quarantine pest, see that little accumulated thing there? It, so white, and they call it white rust because it looks white on the chrysanthemum plant. And all these little white blotches here were all um, spores, but the, pus, the rust pustules it's got a really pretty spore. It's it's clear and it looks like crystal. It's it's a, it's a really pretty spore under the microscope. But if you had a greenhouse and that was your Mother's Day crop, guess what has to happen? Uh, they get ripped out. That was that was the nursery in Encinitas, unfortunately. Which um, this is a disease of cool, wet conditions. So if they can, you know, get some more light, get some more air movement, get some more heat in there, you can't avoid it. Yes? When your inspectors, I don't know if your inspectors, county inspectors, do some of that ripping yes. out. Um, where do they usually dispose of? It goes yeah. to the landfill, gets <coughs> double bag in landfill. And just with everything else, there's not a special disease area in the landfill? No. <coughs> no. Once in a while, we've been able to piggyback on, but they don't like you to. They don't want outsiders there. With the DEA, the DEA's got mm -hmm. some big burners down by the border where they burn their confiscated drugs and things. <laughs> but they, they really don't want outsiders in there. So once in a great while, we can really piggyback when the DEA's doing a burn and get some of that stuff in there, but not very often. It usually has to go to the landfill. Yeah, so. Darn it, you know, that's always an interesting one when you <laughs> see how the DEA operates and the barbed wire everywhere. <laughs> anyway, yes? Um, some of the succulent plants, like an Echeveria, they 
they tell me they inject a fungi into it, which makes the leaves kind of warp and people like them. Have you ever heard of anything like that? I'm not a fungus. I've seen mites. Aloe mite um, causes real distortions on aloes. Right. But. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. That's a new one. But I'd like to learn more, like, what fungus they're using. Yeah, I would like to know, too. I mean, I don't know. It seems like you want to do the opposite than inject something into a plant. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. That's a new one. Okay. All right. Well, did I see another question there somewhere? No? Okay. All right. Um, rose rust is also another really pretty spore. That's, that's the rose rust spore. That's the um, daylily rust spore. Now, rusts have complicated life cycles that we won't go into too much, but they do have more than one type of spore, depending on what stage of their life cycle they're in. They can have up to five different spores. Mm -hmm. So, And you will often see two of them together at the same time. That's the repeating stage spore. And these big ones are the um, kind of the overwintering spore, where they're going to stop growing for a while and wait till winter. And that same thing here, you've got both stages. You've got the big teleospore, the overwintering spore, and the repeating stage spore, the urea spore, there on from the daylily. And this is the this is one of the few pathogens that really blows around in the wind. And they call this the this is what a plant pathologist thinks of as the rust belt. <laughs> <laughs> or if you really want to get complicated, this is the Poxinia pathway. <laughs> And this is in relation to our wheat, our wheat crop every year. Um, because, of course, it, gets, it starts earlier in Mexico, where they, they grow wheat. And um, if they watch, they very carefully watch. There's a, a center in St. Paul, Minnesota here, at the University of Minnesota, that watches the strains of wheat that are happening, that are, are the strains of rust that are infecting what varieties of wheat down in Mexico so that as it starts to blow up and hits Texas, and then by the time it gets up to here, hopefully, just like the CDC does with, influ with flu vaccine, we've, they've told the farmers what varieties to plant that are resistant to the rust strains this year. So um, hopefully you can catch it before it gets too bad by planting the right resistant varieties. And they're working on working on that, or they're trying to do that now with, this is soybean rust. Soybean rust got here just a few years ago. Um, it blew up from the Caribbean and into, into <coughs> this area. So this is where the, the soybean pockets are now, and it blows up every year. Um, the only good thing about soybean rust is it also goes to kudzu. So, you know, <laughs> you've got an alternate host there, but it knocks back the kudzu a little bit. So, anyway, they do watch how the rusts on our, on our important food crops how they spread very carefully and what varieties they are and what strains of the rust there are. And it's a constant battle, just like you hear about with the flu vaccines every year. What strain of flu do we have? What strain of rust do we have? What can we do about it? All right, control measures. Um, I always want you to put the right plant in the right place. You know. <coughs> That really helps a lot if, <laughs> if you don't put that shade tolerant plant right out in the sun and uh, you don't put the plant that needs all the, all the sun in the shade and uh, you match it for the amount of water that's going on because trees often need different amounts of water than the lawn and they really should be on different sprinkler systems if possible. And um, so people keep putting, now I've seen a lot of it now people are planting you know, they're being good. They're going to drought tolerant yards and drought tolerant plants, and they still on the same irrigation system that sprinkles them three times a week. <laughs> so, you know, there's still a lot of work that you guys will be doing to talk to people about putting the right plant in the right place. Um, to cultural methods first, don't overwater, uh, proper pruning, keeping the pests out all these different measures that I know you're going to be hearing a lot about. Sanitation, 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 getting the infected plant material out of there so it doesn't just stay to harbor and infected new plant material all the time. That, that's probably one of the most important things. Um, resistant varieties, wherever possible. 
And, you know, I'm not against fungicides if you need to. You know, if you need to, if you need to go with proper, that is part of integrated pest management, you know, the right chemical at the right time can really save you a lot of problems in the future and a lot more chemical use if you, if you can help it. You know, it's, um, so use the right thing. And this is where, remember that plant disease triangle from before? This is, this is how I think of the triangle. You've always got the host, you've always got the pathogen, and this is the environment. You've got to tilt it. Well, you know, you take all your little weights, you take all these, the, the variety, the sanitation, you take all your little weights and you put them up here to favor the host side. So you all, then the only thing you can really alter is your environment. So try to weight that on the side of the plant you're trying to grow to make it happy. So. And by the way, this morning, like the bauhinias and the calistamins, I just about never see them in the, in the lab. So, you know, they're good so far. <laughs> okay, this is your quiz. Yeah. You didn't know there was going to be a quiz, huh? <laughs> All right, you, 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 you're being a really good master gardener, and somebody's got this problem that you can't figure out over the phone. And you're going, okay, what's going on? So you go out and you look in their yard. And you, and you see these dead shrubs. Okay, what are you going to do? What are you thinking about? What could it be? What kind of tree is it? Winter. Yeah, I don't even know what kind of tree it is. But, but that is the first question. <laughs> yeah, what kind of tree is it? So you might think root rot, you know, you might think gopher damage, you, you know, no something one. went on with the roots, who knows, you know. And then you look around and you see other plants oh. around it also have some damage. Yeah, you guys are really good. <laughs> that was a dispute with the homeowner and um, and his pest control person. <laughs> and the homeowner fired the pest control person, so he took his roundup and did that to their yard. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that was a that was a pesticide complaint, and those pictures were taken by one of our pesticide inspectors. <laughs> but yeah, ask a lot of questions. Be out there. That's um, and I'm ready to answer any more questions you might have. So. Red apple ice plant. Okay, red apple ice plant. Yeah, I've seen it around my neighborhood as well, and all of a sudden, I didn't know it today. Does it all have to come out and or cut back? We don't know yet. Oh. We, we don't. This is the first report of that disease in the Western Hemisphere. It was previously only reported from South Africa and New Zealand, and I don't think anybody's worked on it as far as control measures or you know does it need to come out. The spores are going to stay in the soil for a while. We know that, but we also know that it hates hot weather. So um, I. I just don't know yet. And if you wanted to try a fungicide, there are fungicides that are used, you know, for the other downy mildews. Mm -hmm. Grape gets a downy mildew too. So I would think something that works, that's registered for use on an ornamental plant, you could try it and see. It might work. I we just don't know about this yet. And nobody's working on it in the United States that I know about. Yeah. Yeah, it's all over it's all over San Diego County for sure. Yeah. So you talked about rust, like daylily rust and gladiola rust. If you have that on one of your plants, like daylilies, mm -hmm. um, and you decide to live with on the daylily, is that okay, or is it going to yes. spread to other non-daylily? No, this one only goes to daylily. Okay, so they're specific most of them. Some, yes, for the most part they are. Yes. Yeah. So if somebody would like to bring a sample into you, what exactly would be your directions or how they, like, do they call you first? Or? No, they can just bring it into the front okay, desk. So what exactly is your, would you like if somebody were to bring in a sample? Something fresh, you know, not completely dead, and it hasn't been, you know, you didn't take the sample and then you threw it in the back of the pickup truck for five days. And, well, our landscape care guys do that sometimes, you know, they're, they're out of sight and they want to know what's going on, and so they throw it in, but then they don't get around to bringing it in for a while. <laughs> So it's got to be fresh. It's got to be. It's got to be symptomatic. 
It's got to have the symptoms on it. A lot of times when you're looking for a pathogen, you only find it on that edge between the damaged tissue and the healthy tissue. You know, the, the damaged tissue, the, the oldest damaged tissue is already rotting. The secondary organisms have moved in. The healthy tissue doesn't have it yet. So you need that edge between healthy and diseased tissue if you can. And um, various and different parts of the plant if possible, wherever it's got symptoms, but if you can get like soil and roots okay. and leaves and stuff, so also much, it helps. Soil. If I'm going to run a salt test, because mm -hmm. we've seen lots and lots of salt damage um, around, it's, I need at least a quart. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it takes a quart to do the salt test. So that's so yeah ideally if, if you can sample all parts of the plant I realize with a tree it's very hard pictures help they can email us pictures or they can attach them to the sample so yeah and we have two offices San Marcos and Kearney Mesa you can bring it into either one the San Marcos is open from 8 to 4 Monday through Friday and the San Diego one's open 8 to 5 Monday through Friday so yes in disinfecting tools, the chapter mentioned one to nine bleach. Mm -hmm. Is alcohol equally effective or using the little fire starter burner? Yes. They're both just fine. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And so are some of the hospital disinfectants also. So like Lysol and that, that is what they use for the sudden oak death stuff. They, everybody carries big spray cans of Lysol with them. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So is a fungus, but you're using an antiviral spray? Yes. Okay. That's what they're using for it. <laughs> well, it's an antimicrobial, I think, okay. and it's a microbe, so they are used, that is what they use. Yeah. Yes? But you're saying that all the uh, diseased plants, they put in landfill, but like Miramisa landfill, we get the soil from there, doesn't it yeah. spread no, the disease? No, when it's, when it's a quarantine pest like that, they stand there and watch them bury it. It does not go into the recycling system. Yeah, it, no, that gets buried like the trash that gets buried, and they have to stand there and watch it get buried. What do you suggest we do as home gardeners if we have a diseased plant? Put it in your regular trash. But then it goes yeah. to landfill then. Yeah. And then it doesn't get buried because it's from our home. No, it does get buried. It's getting buried. Oh, when it's not in, when it's not in your, Green waste, okay. don't put it in your green waste. You know, put it in the trash trash, it gets buried. Oh, it does get buried? Yeah. Along with all the trash? Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But if it's a common pest, you know, that that's only for the quarantine type pests. If it's a common pest and it's already all over the place, you, you know, <laughs> kind of depends. So use your best judgment to be responsible. Yeah. In northern, uh, well, north of LA in Paso Robles, there's a lot of dead oak trees, mm -hmm. and there's mistletoe blowing on the oak trees. Is are the oak trees killed by the sudden death, and then the mistletoe this is a plant that just takes over to look? I don't green. think mistletoe grows on a dead tree. Yeah. I think well, it's got to be still it's somewhat alive. Is the mistletoe killing the tree? It makes it weaker, but it doesn't necessarily kill it. They look dead. Except for it's not like a sycamore in its winter? No, it's no. they're all okay. 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 I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Maybe a couple more questions and then Okay. Sir. If athletes have athletes books, what do astronauts have? <laughs> I don't know. What? Uh, of course. Of course. What's what's a pirate's favorite root rotting fungus? Arr, malaria. <laughs> One more from somebody who hasn't asked anything yet. Yeah. This is kind of a, a, or a bigger question, but I'm just wondering since they started uh, washing or monitoring plant pathogens, have they noticed an increase, and what do they think is the cause? Is it globalization? Yeah, could could you yeah, could well what was the question again if I'm sorry, what? Oh, could you repeat that please? Oh sure. Um I was asking if since 
since they've been tracking um, plant pathogens, if they've noticed an increase or an accelerated rate yes. of disease, and what they think the causes are? Um, I think there's two causes. Number one, we're getting a lot better at um, identifying these things. So, um, you know, with, with our improved diagnostic methods and they've got, you know, little dipstick tests and things like that now. So diagnosis is better than it used to be. And number two, people are moving more and more and more faster. And there actually was a study, a fairly, I think it's a 2014 study out of the University of Exeter in England. And they looked at that. They looked at the number of pests found in different countries, and they separated them by like Europe and North America and South America and everything. And their study said that by 2050, if it keeps up, everything will be everywhere. Mm -hmm. All of the pests will be distributed on every place, in, you know, where that crop is grown. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to adapt. We're, it's definitely going to change how we do things if we have more and more pests. California was blessed at first with having very few pests being isolated by deserts and oceans and mountains. And now we're not anymore. We're not isolated anymore. And things are coming in faster and faster. So. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Yeah. Sorry, personal preference. Well, <laughs> what impact do you anticipate climate change may have on different vectors, insects with hotter weather, raining in different parts of the, of the year, perhaps? What, what impact might that have in the fourth in the long term? Yeah, I, I don't know, but yeah, lack of dormant season for insects, lack of you know cold weather to knock them back. Um, if they're vectors, you could have more disease that way. It, you don't know yet. So, but it, we know it's going to change, and we're going to have to figure out ways to live with it and still grow our food. So, okay. Didn't I tell you she was great? Yeah. <laughs>